So good afternoon for uh, those of you who are um, joining us from Europe or from uh, the CET zone. Uh, good morning or good evening for others who might uh, be joining us from other parts of the world. And thank you for joining us for this second lecture from the Eurobica um, series. Uh, I am Charles Farruja, president of uh, Eurobica. And for those who might not be very familiar with ICA and how um, uh, Eurobica works, uh, basically, Eurobica is the European regional branch of the International Council on Archives. And uh, its scope is to strive and foster collaboration between European archivists and archival institutions with the target of strengthening the European archival heritage. For this lecture, we chose the theme Safe Havens for Archives at Risk. Uh, and we are honored to have with us a distinguished speaker, Sahar Amar. Uh, Sahar is a program officer at Swiss Peace. Her regional focus lies on the Middle East and North Africa region. In her current role, Sahar contributes to local peace building efforts, supports consultations processes with civil society actors and works on enhancing the capacity of various international and national stakeholders in thematic areas related to peace building, such as dealing with the past, mediation, dialogue and conflict prevention. Sahar holds an MAS in Transitional Justice, Human Rights and the Rule of Law from the Geneva Academy of International Humanitarian Law and Human Rights, an MA in Conflict Intervention from the University of Montpellier, and an LLM in Comparative Law from the International University College of Turin. This presentation is being uh, recorded, and I take the opportunity to thank uh, the team at uh, ICA for their technical support. And we will take questions at the end of the session, and we do encourage you to participate in that discussion. Um, we also have the question and answer, the Q&A facility. So whoever wants to send any question or pass any comment about uh, the team or about the, the point Sahar will be making in her presentation, uh, please, uh, please feel free to use um, ideally the Q&A, uh, not the chat um, function. Basically, that's it by way of introduction. I leave uh, the floor to our distinguished speaker. Thank you, Charles. Uh, good afternoon, Charles, and good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you, Charles, again, for the kind introduction. Also for providing us with the opportunity to present uh, the Safe Havens for Archives at Risk Initiative during this online lecture. Uh, so um, as Charles mentioned, uh, the topic of today is uh, the, this initiative called the Safe Havens uh, for Archives at Risk International Initiative. So, uh, so I will try to explain uh, the mandate of the initiative, the work, the type of cases and support we provide. And uh, maybe also at the beginning, I would like to mention that um, I will not touch up on the technical aspects uh, of, the, of the work. I know there will be like many technical questions and elements related to safe havens, but uh, as uh, Charles mentioned, I'm not an archivist. I come from the peace building and political perspective, um, but I will try to give a, a comprehensive um, overview of the of the safe havens for archives at risk uh, initiative. Uh, so my presentation will be structured as follows. Uh, I will start with the presentation of the framework in which this initiative was created. Uh, I will explain some of the key concepts uh, and terms uh, that we use um, in, the, in the initiative uh, and in our work. Uh, I will explain also some of the reasons and challenges that triggered our discussions uh, and exchanges about safe havens and also that led or resulted in the creation of the Safe Havens for Archives at Risk Initiative. Uh, and then I will walk you through the website of the initiative. I will explain the composition, as I said, the mandate, the goals, um, and the type of cases, requests, and support we provide. Uh, so um, I will share my screen. I hope it's uh, you can you will be able to to, to see my screen. Um, okay. Uh, so regarding the uh, as I said the framework. Uh, so regarding as I said the framework of the of the mandate. 
so this uh, the framework of the initiative. So the Safe Havens for Camps at Risk initiative has been uh, created and implemented within the framework of the mandate called Archives and Dealing with the Past. Uh, this is an official mandate from the first uh, federal department of foreign affairs uh, since 2011. So in 2011, the Swiss uh, foreign department of foreign affairs has mandated officially Swiss Swiss to work on the topic of archives of the past. Uh, the mandate is still ongoing since um, 2011, as I said. Uh, and here you can find the website of the mandate so that you can get like more more um, details, uh, or detailed information about it. Uh, but in general, the uh, in general the, the goal of this mandate is to um, enhance and build the capacities of relevant actors, whether international, national, or local, in the field of archives and dealing with the past. Uh, it also aims at um, uh, emphasizing the importance of archives. And here within the mandate, when we speak about archives, we speak about uh, archives and records that document human rights violations. Uh, violations. Uh, so the mandate also tries to uh, emphasize the contribution of those human rights records and archives for future or potential uh, dealing with the past or transitional justice process. So it looks at this link between the human rights archives and the dealing with the past or transitional justice. The mandate also uh, aims at contributing to uh, securing, preserving, and making accessible um, uh, human rights archives uh, at risk. Uh, so I will explain, how, as I said, like some of the key concepts that we use at the mandate, but also we use at the initiative, at the Safe Havens for Archives initiative. Uh, so we understand archives or records as uh, material created or received by a person, family or organization, public or private, in the conduct of their affairs. And such materials are preserved as archives, records, when they contain information of enduring value or evidence uh, of the functions and possibilities of their creator or receiver. And we understand dealing with the past or transitional justice as processes for addressing the rights of victims and societies as a whole, as well as the obligations of states with regard to truth, justice, reparations, and guarantees of non-recurrence in the aftermath of grave human rights violations, breaches of international humanitarian law, and related grave forms of corruption that facilitated these crimes. So as I mentioned in the big, at the beginning, uh, we uh, try to make this link between the, uh, or we try to emphasize the potential use of, of human rights archives for dealing with the past mechanisms, truth commissions, uh, judicial mechanisms, reparations, uh, or uh, or mem memory or memorialization uh, initiatives. So this is regarding the bigger framework or the bigger mandate in which the uh, the Safe Havens for Archives at Risk was was created. And also, this is why uh, Swiss People to Act uh, as the coordinator or the secretariat of the Safe Havens for Archives at Risk Initiative, because we have uh, this mandate um, uh, in, under which we created uh, or under which the Safe Havens for Archives at Risk Initiative was established. Um, so now, as I said, regarding the pieces or challenges that triggered uh, the discussion about archives, safe havens, and then the outcome was the creation of this initiative or the establishment of this initiative. Uh, so, as some of you maybe uh, know, uh, there are cases, for instance, of local CSOs, uh, local civil society organizations, or local uh, NGOs uh, handing over their their archives or records that contain about human rights violations to international organizations. And some in some of these cases, for instance, uh, local CSOs and local NGOs they were not able anymore to access their archives. So basically, they lost access and they lost their ownership. Uh, so this is one of the challenges that we that triggered uh, basically uh, the, the the topic of uh, safe havens uh, and archives at risk. Uh, there are also other concrete cases. For instance, uh, the case of the historical archives of the National Police uh, of Guatemala. Uh, so this case, uh, I won't go into details, but I will maybe uh, put in the chat the link to uh, a publication written by Swiss based on this specific case. My colleagues have uh, have drafted this. Uh, but for instance, in the case of the historical archives of the National Police of Guatemala, um, a, secure, a security copy of the archives was brought to Switzerland. Um, and when the process was initiated, many challenges or questions was raised, were raised. So for instance, there were questions about relationship and power dynamics between sending and hosting institutions. Uh, there were questions about where the archives would, would be hosted, whether in the in a national archives or in a government institution. 
who is going to cover the expenses of the hosting of the archives, who is going to also to uh, cover the expenses and ensure the maintenance of archives, uh, who would be committed to the focal point in both countries in case there would be a system uh, So these are also some of the challenges or questions that was that were raised within uh, this the framework of this case. Uh, there were, for instance, other cases, um, and this makes the argument that uh, there is a practice, basically, there is a proven practice of uh, looking for safe havens for archives at risk and looking for a safe place to uh, put uh, a copy of archives that uh, contain uh, human rights uh, information or information related to human rights violations. So, for instance, again, two cases related, related to Switzerland. Uh, we have the case of the Martian Islands nuclear claims uh, tribunals, the, the records of these uh, nuclear claim tribunals. Uh, again, a copy, a security copy of these records were um, were, were put in Switzerland, uh, and also within this case, there were questions about uh, digitization, uh, about building the capacity of local actors in digitizing the the, the records and the archives. Um, recently, also there were a case of uh, the archives of the Colombian Truth Commission, so uh, a digital backup uh, copy was also. Uh, of the, of the archives of the Colombian Truth Commission was also put in Switzerland. So there are challenges and there are the, uh, there is how to say like a proven practice of uh, providing uh, safe havens for, for archives at risk or for sensitive archives that contain uh, sensitive information. And these archives that are part of the, uh, of the country or the people's national history and that can be uh, used for potential as we said, dealing with the past processes, uh, reconstitution, uh, truth, uh, truth telling, uh, memory, or the or, or the revelations. So basically, when we are faced with these cases and we, we heard and we learned about these cases and challenges, uh, we thought that uh, it would be uh, it's it would be uh, needed to basically to uh, put in place such an initiative and also uh, to uh, develop documents that contain. Uh, standards and good practices uh, with regards to safe patents and with regards to items at risk. Um, so that uh, all these challenges uh, and all these questions that I spoke about can be dealt with uh, in advance and risks can be mitigated or challenges can be mitigated. Um, so this is, as I said, uh, the, the, the cases and the challenges that uh, tr triggered the discussions on safe havens for caps at risk. Um, and the title, you can see that we are interested or we look at the the, uh, the archives who are at risk and we have a broad understanding on, on, of the types of risk. Uh, so, of course, there is like uh, risks uh, in contexts where there is ongoing armed conflicts, uh, where there is uh, political and security instabilities. Uh, so archives could be at risk, especially that we are speaking about archives that contain sensitive information about uh, human rights violations. Uh, there are also risks in uh, contexts where repressive regimes are in place. Uh, we are also speaking about uh, about uh, environmental risks. Uh, so in case of uh, natural calamities, earthquakes, fires, or um, cases of uh, climate change and changing sea levels, as we see in the cases of some islands. Uh, sometimes also the risk can be uh, related to the, to the existing uh, local capacity or the existing archival resources. So sometimes also there is a lack of capacity and lack of archival resources, which um, uh, results in uh, maybe in poor, uh, in poor preservation conditions, and this might put at risk the quality uh, of the archives, for instance. Uh, so these are the types of risk that we look at also in the initiative. You have a broad understanding of what is risk. Uh, and uh, now also we come to the, uh, I now we'll speak concretely about the uh, uh, the initiative itself, the Safe Havens for Archives at Risk Initiative after after uh, this presentation about the, the, the challenges and the, and the, also the, the, the explanation on definition of concepts. Uh, so I will explain quickly the, um, the objectives of this uh, initiative and then I will walk you through the, the website. Uh, so this initiative uh, was created, as I said, um, to promote arrangements that comply with, uh, to promote safe havens arrangements that comply with good practices and standards, because as I said, there are like different um, risks and challenges that could uh, occur or that could happen within uh, specific cases. 
uh, and for this, I will explain later for these good practices and standards. Also, there are, there are some resources um, and guiding principles that were developed for this. Uh, the, the initiative also, uh, I will explain later also the composition. Uh, there are different uh, representatives of different uh, entities within the, the, uh, the initiative. And the aim is to facilitate contact between institutions holding archives or records at least, and also suitable hosting institutions. Uh, another also uh, objective of the initiative is to provide guidance or specific advice concerning safe haven solutions and provide support in case of disputes, uh, and also uh, contributing on questions related to safe havens for archives at risk at the policy level. Uh, so we try also to participate in the policy discussion, we try to participate, for instance, also in, in conferences, um, that uh, discuss uh, or that touch up on uh, this topic. Uh, I will stop sharing this presentation and I will go directly to the to the uh, the website. I will stop sharing. Uh, so this is the website of the Safe Havens for Archives at Risk. Uh, maybe at the beginning, it's worth mentioning also that the the website and the resources uh, has been made available in different languages, in Arabic, English, Spanish, French, Russian, and even some of the uh, resources are available in Ukrainian, uh, because we try to reach to uh, a wide audience uh, and to make the initiative and its resources accessible for different actors from different contexts. Uh, so regarding the uh, initiative, um, as you see here in the website, you can find like different uh, parts about the initiative is basically this part basically describes the history of the initiative and the different events and conferences and meetings that led to its creation. But I will jump directly into uh, the composition of the, uh, of the Safe Havens for Archives at Risk initiative. So the uh, initiative has a, an advisory committee. The advisory committee brings together um, representatives of uh, different entities that are interested in the topic of archive or that works on the topic of archives. Uh, so we have uh, representatives of international organizations. We have the International Council on Archives represented in the initiative and the advisory committee. Uh, we have the International Committee of the Red Cross. Uh, we have also UNESCO who have recently rejoined uh, the, um, the, the advisory committee. So these are we have so we have representatives representatives of international institutions who who deal with, who have an expertise in the topic of archives or who deal with uh, human rights archives and records. Um, we also have representatives of governmental institutions. We have the Swiss Federal Department of Foreign Affairs, uh, the Swiss Federal Archives, the National Records of Scotland, and the National Archives of Finland. So also these governmental institutions uh, were brought into the advisory committee because they have an experience in providing safe haven uh, for archives at risk. As I mentioned, Switzerland had uh, experiences in Guatemala, Martian Islands, uh, in Colombia. Uh, but also uh, the other national archives also they had experiences in hosting uh, copies of archives at risk. Uh, so we have here the perspective of of a hosting institution represented represented, and we have also solutions or concrete solutions for hosting institutions represented in the advisory committee. Uh, we also have a representatives of non-governmental institutions. Uh, uh, so we have, for instance, the International Institute for Social History uh, as a non-governmental institution, but also as a as a hosting institution who is represented in the in the in the advisory committee. We have the University of Reading, the University of Texas of Texas, and as you know, also some of the universities they keep or they host in their libraries also copies of archives. Uh, and we have uh, also a representative of the local NCO who works on the, on the, on the, on the field of human rights. So we have Umam Documentation and Research, which is a local NGO based in uh, Lebanon. Uh, so here we have also the perspective of local NGO and the perspective of the host, a potential sending institution also represented in the advisory committee. And we also have individual experts. We have Trudy Peterson and David Shatton. Uh, so these are individual experts who worked on a specific case Havens and the accompanied processes of uh, of of, um, of placing uh, copies of archives at risk in a in a safe place. Uh, so we tried in the advisory committee basically to reflect different perspectives um, and different backgrounds of institutions and institutions and dependent experts. Uh, 
uh, and the advisory committee, as I said, uh, as I explained in the mandate of the initiative, the advisory committee meets uh, every three to four months. Um, we receive cases of or requests of uh, archives at risk through the email uh, of the uh, through, through either either through Swissbees or either through the email of the initiative. And uh, in the uh, in the advisory committee, we try to deliberate about these cases. We assess the cases. Uh, we discuss them and we try to find safe haven solutions. Uh, sometimes safe haven solutions have been found within the advisory, within the members of the advisory committee, because as I said, we have representatives of hosting institutions uh, presented. And sometimes also we facilitate uh, the contact between the standing institution and potential hosting institution also outside of or beyond the, the representatives of the, of the advisory committee. So another another national archive or another national uh, national uh, hosting institution as not represented in the advisory committee and we try to facilitate the contact and also to accompany the process to make sure that good practices and standards are are being applied and uh, respected uh, in the in this process um i will explain later the cases but i wanted uh, before that uh, to uh, also show you the uh, documents uh, that was produced and that we try to apply or make use of uh, when we uh, when we secure safe haven solutions for for target uh, so we have a document that has been uh, developed and it's called guiding principles for safe havens for archives at risk uh, it's a principle of, it's a document of 18 principles uh, and this principle uh, and these 18 principles uh, aim to ensure that the terms and conditions of a safe haven agreement between a funding and hosting institution comply with the principles of legality, uh, fairness, transparency, and conflict sensitivity. Uh, I will show you, for instance, the English uh, version, uh, just for you to have an idea about the different principles. Uh, so, for instance, we have principles related to the last resort principle, uh, which means that, for instance, uh, the physical archives uh, should not be, uh, uh, the, basically, the transfer of the original copies and the original physical archives to, uh, to uh, outside the country of origin should be, for instance, the very last resort. Uh, we have also uh, principles related to ethics, related to legality, uh, related to ownership, uh, to anticipating su succession, uh, to um, the rapid response. So there are 18 principles uh, that you can uh, find in this document. And again, this document is uh, is being uh, is is available in different languages. Uh, and again, this document also has been drafted, taking into consideration the different perspectives. Uh, so people from so as I said like the the representatives of these different entities they took part in the in the drafting of these guiding principles so we have the different considerations and the different perspectives being, uh, being reflected or taken into consideration uh, there is also a second document which is a commentary to the guiding principles that I have just shown uh, and this commentary also uh, illustrates the application of the principles and explains in depth uh, the the each uh, each uh, principle individually, and then we have a model agreement. Uh, so the model agreement it's um, an example of an agreement or a model of an agreement between the standing and hosting institution, uh, and it aims at clarifying uh, the consideration to be agreed upon before the transaction of archival holdings or records between the host standing and the hosting institution. Again, all of these uh, documents are available in different languages, um, and uh, the drafting or the development process, or the different perspectives uh, has been and uh, considerations have been taken into 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 account. Uh, also, in the website, you can find, for instance, resources. Resourcing meaning, for instance, like articles written by uh, members of the advisory committee, or publications on the topic of archives and the past, or also recording of previous webinars or events uh, uh, during which we we uh, presented the initiative. Uh, so this is uh, the, the the initiative. Uh, before going for into the cases, I wanted also, as I explained, the advisory committee meets every four months in order to deliberate about the cases and try to find safe haven solutions. I wanted also to show you um, a document uh, which is a questionnaire that we usually send to the 
sending to the potential sending institution to try to uh, get more clarification uh, about uh, the, the type of archives uh, because this helps the advisory committee to better understand the risks, to better understand the situation and the type of, of, of archives that the sending institution uh, holds. Um, so we'll stop sharing the website and they will show you the, uh, the questionnaire. Uh, so this is the questionnaire that we usually uh, share with the sending institution. And it has different questions, for instance, questions about the type of institution, the, you know, the sending institution, uh, explanation about the risk and threats and its eminence, uh, what kind of risks are involved, potential, potential political sensitivity of the request, uh, specification questions about the specification of the archives or the records of risk, uh, there are also questions about technical information, such as the type of media, the data volume, uh, the language of materials, uh, the soft software, etc. And then also questions about uh, ownership, uh, questions about contractual uh, contractual information, uh, uh, questions about access. So these are the different also um, questions or considerations that we try to understand in order to better find a, a suitable solution for this case. Uh, I will go back now to the uh, PowerPoint presentation. Uh, I think I have a problem with the... Uh, I hope now you can see the uh, the presentation. So I think we we spoke about the, the different and also for the guiding principles. Also, one information that I uh, forgot to 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 mention that the guiding principles also have been endorsed by the International Council on Archives. Uh, so this is also an information about the guiding principles. Uh, we have seen the guiding principles. So now I wanted to speak about the specific cases. Um, and the specific requests and support we are receiving. Uh, so as I said, our understanding about the, the risks uh, or the type of risks is, is, is broad. Uh, so we received a request from countries where there is an ongoing conflict or an armed conflict. For instance, we received a request from uh, an organization, uh, from a civilian organization. And sometimes also we received requests from uh, entities uh, in, and they will explain later the type of entities from contexts where there is a political and, and security instability, for instance, uh, from the Horn of Africa, Southeast Asia, from Afghanistan. Uh, there are also cases from, uh, as we said, uh, countries where uh, there are environmental risks and where the sea levels are raising. Uh, and also we received cases from uh, countries where there is a new or previous repressive regimes, such as uh, cases from Latin America. Also, like one thing, I won't go into the details of each case because we receive we receive the requests on a confidential basis, so I cannot share the details about the specific case or the specific uh, entity who was in touch with us or the the content of the items because we receive all the requests on the confidential basis. Uh, but I will try to give like a general overview to better explain the work and the support we provide. Uh, so these are the basically the context from where we receive cases. Uh, regarding the entities, for instance, we received uh, requests from local NGOs and CSOs, uh, local CSOs. Some of them are both based on the ground, others are based in the diaspora. Uh, we received also cases from individual human rights defenders. Uh, there are also cases from organizations, uh, potential hosting organizations based in Europe that lack capacities. Uh, to secure um, to secure um, a safe haven for specific archives, or who have also questions and uh, queries about the about about uh, safe havens, because as we said, also uh, one of the mandates of the advisory committee is to provide advice uh, on specific cases. Uh, and also, we receive, for instance, requests from organizations on the ground who are looking for specific safe haven conditions. Uh, so, for instance, there is an NGO from the Horn of Africa. They have been looking from, for different uh, 
potential hosting institutions. They were in contact with some of them, and some of some of the hosting institutions. They, for instance, they um, they uh, accepted to host the items. But in return, there is a condition that the local NGO, for instance, is, is not won't be able to access the archives for a certain amount of time. So we receive also cases for from NGOs who are the most suitable um, uh, hosting uh, or safe haven solution. Uh, regarding the cases or the type of archives that we receive or the requests that we are receiving, some of the organizations they have themes, videos, photos, testimonies, pictures uh, that uh, that they, they are they are putting on a specific server. And for instance, they are afraid that the server might be shut down because they live in a context where there is repressive regime and there is instability, and they want to keep the digital or the uh, another uh, a secure copy in a in a more secure. Uh, server outside of the country. Uh, other cases, for instance, uh, we, we, we speak about digital uh, security copies of archives. So some organizations, they have physical documents, uh, but they are planning to digitize them. So they need capacity building on digitizing and um, they reach out to us for safe havens, for looking for safe haven solutions for these uh, digitized uh, copies. Because as I said at the beginning, um, the case of, of physical transferring physical uh, copies uh, outside of the country of origin is a bit sensitive and we always for us it's the last resort we always try to work on securing copies or digital copies so we always speak about copies in, in outside the country um, as i said the type of support is uh, for instance sometimes we provide or we try to provide a capacity building on digitization or we try to find solutions on digitizations uh, also, as I said, we look for safe haven for digital security copies. Um, some, uh, for, for instance, sometimes, we, as I said, we facilitate the, the contact between uh, a potential sending and potential hosting institution. So, for instance, recently there is uh, an NGO based in Latin America. They have uh, archives uh, which contain sensitive information about criminal violations. Uh, so we um, managed to um, facilitate the contact and accompany the process them at the University of Basel in Switzerland, so a copy of their archives will be hosted at the University of Basel in Switzerland. Um, as I said, for some uh, for some cases also, uh, we managed to find solutions um, uh, in uh, the hosting institutions that are represented represented in the advisory committee. Uh, for other cases also, we uh, facilitated the contact between the standing institution and hosting institution who is not represented in the in the in the advisory committee, but it's but the solutions is always uh, or the suggestions are always collected within the advisory committee. Sometimes we have we still have for instance like pending requests uh, for uh, specific um, uh, cases. Uh, as I said, uh, some NGOs, they look for hosting institutions with a specific uh, uh, safe haven conditions. So they want to make sure that they have access to the information. Uh, they want to make sure that they keep the ownership of the, uh, of, the, of, the, uh, of, the, of the archives and information. So uh, for some cases, we are still trying to look for, um, to look for um, uh, safe haven solutions. Uh, but of course, some some safe and, as I said, some safe safe and solutions have been secured. Others are still pending. It depends on the on the context, and also it depends on the as I said the the type of archives and also the request from the uh, sending institution. Uh, so I think with that I have finished the uh, the, the presentation. You you can find as I said the the website of the Safe Havens for Archives at Risk Initiative. There is also the email uh, of the initiative. Uh, if you have a request or if you have a case or if you have a question, also you can uh, email uh, the initiative. And they will put on the chat uh, the different links that I mentioned, the, the link to the to the archives mandate, the link to the Guatemala uh, publication, uh, and uh, the link to the State Havens for Archives at Risk initiative um, and the email. Uh, so I hope uh, the presentation was useful. I hope I provided enough information. As I said, I didn't touch up on the technical aspects because I'm not an archivist. I'm, I come from a more a peace building or political perspective. And um, I couldn't share like a, very, a lot of details because of the confidential nature of the work. But I think, but I hope I, the presentation was, uh, was, uh, was, uh, was, 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 was fruitful and was helpful. Um, thank you. Thank you for everyone for your listening.
Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Sahar, for that um, presentation. Uh, I still I, I remind um, participants that they can send questions at, uh, in the Q and A, and it's uh, a bit of reflections from what uh, emerged from what we heard uh, in this presentation. It's uh, so encouraging for us archivists working uh, all over Europe and and all over the world, basically, um, that we're starting to have these um, support organizations who um, we can revert to uh, in, in in difficult times in our in our profession we often feel as lone rangers um, battling uh, with our problems within archives we're battling within the different um, national or regional or local or specialized archives uh, where we we operate um, and we're continuously witnessing sort of those of of, of you who follow the ICA Facebook page, the Eurbica Facebook page. Um, unfortunately, we continuously um, uh, read of problems in archives, uh, war, flooding, um, fires, um, theft, inadequate buildings for, for, for the storage. Uh, so in these instances, basically, we often grumbled in the past um, decades ago that um, we're left alone. No one, no one actually is there to support us. And if support was there through ICA or other organizations, this often took a long time to, to, to arrive. Um, this initiative is, all, is literally offering on the spot support because um, it's not sort of after the tragedy happens, we're building the structures, but there is this ongoing infrastructure group of experts that are there that are producing documents um, interesting documents such as the guidelines you you uh, shared with us so basically my my hope is that archives take these opportunities they make themselves and their staff aware of these um, facilities so that um, even in case when we are faced with dramatic situations with flooding with 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 fires um, one can revert to to such um, services um, um, straight away. So basically, thank you for that. It's uh, it's uh, so encouraging. I had a question uh, about I don't know from your statistics or data whether there is some kind of pattern um, which type of um, risk uh, is, is featuring most from the requests that you had. Um, so far, or the approaches you had so far, uh, is there any particular risk archives uh, are reverting, are facing and reverting to you most for? Yeah, thank you, Charles. Thank you for the for the question. Uh, so most of the cases we have received, uh, they are uh, cases of uh, or archives based in countries where there is, uh, um, as I said, in, in Latin America, there is, for instance, like a repressive regime. Uh, in place or previous regime, or there is in general like a political and security instability. Uh, so now if I speak about, for instance, we have a case from Syria, as I said, it's uh, there is an ongoing uh, conflict, so there is a risk for, for this, uh, for, uh, for archives uh, who, for archives containing information about human rights violations. And as I said, the, the cases of Horn of Africa, Southeast Asia, Afghanistan, Latin America, we are mainly speaking about uh, countries or contexts where there is a political and uh, security instability. Uh, so these are, uh, or sometimes also I said we received the case from an uh, uh, rights defender. Uh, so it's uh, so it's more till now like most of the cases they are mainly about uh, even either repressive regimes in place or political and conflict or political and security instability. Um, uh, I'm seeing there's um, a question in, in the chat. Basically, the question is whether um, there were um, cases of physical archives that um, actually have been um, rehoused outside the country of origin um, to find this safe uh, place of refuge. Yeah, so no. So as I said, we don't, uh, for us, like we don't take the original copies outside of the country of origin. We try to work with the digital copies of providing a, a backup security copy for archives at risk uh, outside uh, outside the country. Uh, but we don't work on transferring the original copies uh, outside the country of origin. Uh, we mainly work with uh, with, with uh, providing uh, 
facilitating solutions for for security backup copy of, of, of archives that have been digitized or that are in the process of being digitized. Because as I said, one of the principles in the guiding principle is that uh, rehousing the 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 physical archives outside of the country of origin should be the very last uh, resort. So we try to focus on cases where there is uh, uh, digital copies, and we we try to find solutions for securing a backup copy uh, outside outside, but not the physical. We don't transfer the physical copies outside the country. Okay, um, uh, and 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 this is also a reflection of the value of when you have professional organizations tackling these problems because probably the first um, solution that comes to mind when there is a problem in a particular country is to shift away um, the records. But we do know, who, whoever is in the profession, we do know that that can create new problems of displaced archives and, and, and all the complications, political, geographical complications that that can bring. So uh, even such positions are uh, very much an indication of the professional approach that is being applied. Um, by by organizations such um, such as yours, um, we don't seem to have any um, questions in the Q and A. I don't know whether many anyone from the panel wanted to to make to make any comment. Maybe Vladka, who is with us, yes, Vladka. Yes, uh, thank you, Sahar, for this uh, nice presentation. Maybe if you can uh, come and do, maybe have some recent experience in in European level regarding uh, elementary disasters we are witnessing uh, in recent times. I don't know earthquakes, for example. We have earth earthquake in Croatia. There are floods all around Europe. There are some uh, huge fires that archives were also involved it do you maybe have some your organization some experience with this type of crisis or or this is for some other <laughs> institution to act in such uh sure uh thank you Flatka. as i said like we the our understanding for risk is very broad so also for us i think the truth is our things that are at risk of, uh, because of environmental factors, as you said, of uh, floods or earthquakes or natural calamities in general. Um, I don't think we had uh, maybe a case of uh, how to say a case of uh, of an of a, of, a, of an archive that was at risk because of the environmental factor. And as I mentioned, it was the case of the Martian Islands. Um, uh, but then, but I don't remember, but I don't recall that there was a case where we received requests because of uh, of, uh, of risks uh, related to environmental factors. Uh, yeah. But of course, Thank we receive. But of course, if there is a request, we are happy to receive it because we understand also this is part of the risks that we look at as well. Thank you. So it seems there is uh, Arda who wants to make a comment also or a question. Uh, yeah. You have to, you, okay, yeah. Uh, I would like to add uh, that uh, I'm Arda Scholter, I'm the representative of ICA in uh, the Safe Havens for Archives at Risk project. And um, so we are in uh, contact with the International Blue Shield Organization. Uh, which is focused on, uh, well, risky full situations where archives also can be at risk. And we are developing possibilities of uh, getting uh, work together and maybe share uh, problems or activities. So um, we are thinking about uh, a good way to improve that cooperation with uh, Blue Shield that can be of importance in uh, finding resolutions. That's what I wanted to ask. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Arda, for that comment. And um, we have another question, um, which uh, says, have there been any cases when these international institutions were asked by international courts of law to produce documents in human rights violations? Uh, sorry, Charles, I couldn't uh, hear the question. Um, well, the question is, have there been any cases when these international institutions 
um, were asked by international courts of law to produce documents in human rights violations. To be honest, not in my knowledge, but it's. Uh, but of course, I can take. Um, I I don't have like now a specific example or to say like a concrete answer. But of course, this is a question that, for instance, I can ask some of my colleagues. Um, uh, because okay. I, have been working, I have been working on initiative for during the only the last two years, uh, so maybe there have been an example like that that happened before, or one of the colleagues is aware of this uh, of this uh, of this example. But I can mm -hmm. ask. I don't know what's the question. We can I can see, and then maybe we forward the answer via email to the person. Yeah. Yeah, we do have the contact uh, here. So it's more it's more a question about uh, this question. If we we rewarded a bit, it's more a, a question also of the uh, issue of access. So if 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 uh, sort of an archival collection is at risk in the home country and it's being duplicated, uh, digitized, or or kept kept um, in a safe haven, um, the issue of the access to that collection in the safe haven, whether that shifts to the safe haven board or whether that stays with the, the creating body basically yeah and then just also like something about access as i said like in the guiding principles and also in the generic agreement there are the uh, the, the model agreement uh there are how to say like uh, considerations related access or good practices related to the access to the access uh and i think it's up on the agreement between the hosting and the sending institution because as I said, like we had, for instance, the case of uh, of this uh, organization from the Horn of Africa. They have been looking for the state maintenance. And, and uh, they, they, as, I, as I mentioned, they, they, they found some potential solutions. But the potential hosting organizations, they told them that, okay, if you take, we are happy to take a uh, security copy of your archives, but we won't be able to access it for a certain amount of years. And they didn't agree, the standing institution didn't want to go with this condition. Uh, so, um, so I think it's up on the agreement between the both hosting and sending institution. Uh, I mean, of course, when the organization came to us with this specific case and request, we are trying to look for, or we are trying to look in our network if there is like a hosting institution that is interested in, in hosting these archives and not uh, obliging the sending institution to uh, to uh, this condition. Uh, so we are trying to for like a more suitable condition that uh, uh, more more conditions the more appropriate condition that suits the, the the case of the of the sending institution. But I think at the end it's re really up on the agreement that would be made between both uh, sending and hosting. Thanks. Uh, we have another question um, saying, aside from war, could you please give other cases of destruction of archives through political threats? Outside the requests that we got or the, the question? Um, um, probably cases that you, you might have come across in in, uh, in terms of, of, of the safe haven initiatives, not of destruction through the traditional war, but um political threats so political intervention on the records basically well, i mean as i said i mean unfortunately i cannot give details because we receive requests on a confidential basis so we cannot disclose details uh, because as i said this this these uh, this archives or requests these requests are relevant to archive related to archives exist, so we don't disclose the information to uh, to ensure that the archives will remain in security until uh a safe haven solution will be found. But as I mentioned, like we had, for instance, as I said, like a case of um, an organization from uh, from Guatemala or other Latin American countries. And we have organized uh, requests from the Horn of Africa from countries where, for instance, they, uh, apparently there will be elections. To, so, I mean, we had the case previously where an election will be, for instance, um, hold and there is risk that, that there will be a change in the regime or uh, so we had we had cases. I mean, we can unfortunately I cannot go into the details because of the confidentiality reasons. Uh, but we had cases from or Afghanistan. We had cases from, as I said, like Latin America, um, Afghanistan, and the Horn of Africa, in where there is a risk of, as I said, cases from individual human rights defenders in context where there is a person regime. Human rights defender has like USB and he has information, uh, you know, or documentation on this USB and they were looking for for a safe haven for for this uh, documentation um, because of the repressive regime in place so um, these are the type of uh, as I said types of requests but I cannot unfortunately cannot 
give specific details. Um, yeah. uh, uh, can I ask, please also ask you one question regarding your previous experiences of your organization and cases you have so far, uh, do you have maybe any idea about maybe some future needs and regarding resources you need to keep up with this type of activity or, or support for some future situation? Do you have any idea? Is it enough, uh, like, I don't know, financial and resource and other support that your organization have, or you expect maybe in the future that will be more cases or, or more need and you will need some more organizational or something else resources to be sustainable. Yes. Yeah, so, so for instance, in the initiative, we don't have financial resources to, you know, for instance, to cover the expenses of the transfer of the digital copy or the hosting and the maintenance of the digital copy. So this is something that we, we lack, for instance. So we receive the case, we try to find solutions and sometimes, for instance, I mean, the initiative itself as an initiative doesn't cover the expenses. But for instance, in the case, uh, hosting institution, uh, at the end, it's up on, as I said, the agreement between the sending and the hosting. You know, in most of the cases, it's the hosting institution uh, agrees uh, to cover, for instance, the expenses of the transfer and the hosting and the maintenance. Um, uh, so, but we, as an institute, as an initiative, our, as ourselves, we don't have, for instance, uh, uh, a dedicated fund or a dedicated uh, financial resources to to help uh, to uh, to cover the expenses. Uh, we try more, as I said, to facilitate the contact, uh, to accompany the process, to make sure that the guiding principles and the best practices are, are respected and applied. Uh, we try to give advice, uh, but we. Uh, we we don't have uh, maybe as I said like uh, financial uh, how to say or we don't have materials to as an initiative to do for instance the digitization ourselves. Uh, so we try to find also uh, how to say like uh, as I said like the send it will be an agreement between the sending and the hosting institution on who will cover what and who will uh, support what at the financial. Uh, do you maybe? Sorry, yes, do, yes, you, uh, do you maybe think that, uh, I don't know, regarding your your practice so far and, and you have so insight in the needs and, and capacities you have, do you maybe think that it is important issue and that should be, I don't know, formally support for some, I don't know, international organization or governments or on some other level to provide for this type of support for for archives worldwide or, or, or some other solution or network or initiative or something else to provide some help in, in, in need for those in need. I mean, of course, and this is why also, this is the reason be, be behind having like um, different entities in the advisory committee. So as I said, like we had, for instance, representatives of national archives or representatives of the uh, of the uh, specific department of foreign of foreign affairs. Uh, so, for instance, these institutions might, you know, or the national archives, these institutions might, for instance, cover, you know, like accept to be the hosting institution and might cover the expenses and the financial uh, the financial needs or support with the materials digitization. Or this is why also we have also, as we, as I told you, like an expert independent experts who concretely work on cases and they know what's needed. Um, uh, so also this is the rationale be behind having like a, a wide, uh, how to say, like a, a wider or comprehensive composition and trying we try to bring like different perspectives and entities with different uh, expertise and different capacities as well. Uh, so, so of course, some of the international organizations, as I said, presented or some of the governmental organizations, they have capacities that we don't have as an NGO or we don't have as an, an initiative. So it's so when they, when they, how to say, I mean, they act, uh, they, of course, they provide advice and they provide uh, potential solutions on safe havens, but also, as you said, sometimes we need capacities that goes beyond us. Uh, so this would be an addition also from this specific entity. Um, yeah. Um, Thank you. Yeah, of course, thanks. So um, that brings us to the end of, of uh, this presentation. Um, thank you for, 
for your intervention. Thank you for the questions. I'm sure that there is much more to be discussed, and that's why we have put in the chat uh, links to uh, to the link to the contact. So do feel free to send more questions. Do feel free to uh, get in touch uh, with this organization. Obviously, this uh, safe haven co concept does not offer all the solutions, does not offer all the answers. It's very encouraging that we are seeing. Um, the international community within archives rising to the occasion. So with the latest floods or, or, or tragedies we had and the war in Ukraine, a lot of individual national archives or regional archives um, did support and did give and send personnel or send equipment. Uh, so that new culture of not focusing on the local, not focusing on the immediate needs, but um, uh, fostering this idea of an international community of archivists who are, wherever we're working, we're doing basically the same mission that of preserving the archival heritage of humanity. Um, so that's very encouraging. And definitely this talk was an eye opener for some who might not have, um, uh, might not, not have uh, heard yet of this safe haven initiative. And even for us who were already um, familiar to some extent with this initiatives, it was, um, very informative and it did help to clarify also the real work um, that you are doing. So um, thank you, Sahar, for your presentation. Thank you, the other um, members on the on the panel. Uh, thanks also to ICA for supporting us with the technical side of this um, presentation. Thank you very much.